This is Twit. Well, you know, I mentioned a little earlier we we're going to talk about coax tonight. And I've got a piece here that's, well, this is not squirrel proof because I, I don't know if y'all will remember back, but a couple of years ago I was not able to be on the show one night because squirrels had chewed up the coax coming in to, um, to my shack here and had no internet. But this is a piece of RG6 here with the messenger cable attached to keep the pressure off of it. And, you know, a lot of this stuff now has both a foil shield and a uh, wire shield on it for a braid. I wanted to talk a little bit about coax because there's, there's some characteristics to it that uh, we should know about. Now, you know, we can, we can do matching and, and various tricks to get more uses with different types of coax. First, let's just look at what it is. Uh, coaxial cable is exactly that. It's, it's coaxial. On the outside there, we've got a plastic jacket, generally. After that, you've got a metallic shield, and that can be foil. Uh, it can be uh, copper braid, uh, aluminum braid on some uh, cheaper uh, television coax. Uh, it could be uh, foil, or, you know, it could actually be um, a solid copper pipe. Then you've got the dielectric insulator, and in some applications, not so much for ham radio, although you, we could certainly use it, that dielectric insulator there will be air. And there'll just be standoffs holding the center conductor in the center there. And, uh, you know, you'll have to keep some kind of pressure in that line, nitrogen or dry air or something, to keep the moisture out. But most of the stuff we use has some type of uh, plastic or Teflon, uh, some type of dielectric insulator there. And then the center conductor, of course, can be either solid or stranded cable. All depends on the application. And what determines the impedance of this cable? Well, it's basically the, um, the spacing between that center conductor and that metallic shield. For a given size of shield there, you can vary the size of that center conductor, and that will change the impedance of the cable. Uh, the characteristic impedance... Uh, is also affected by the dielectric insulator there. In 1929, Bell Laboratories did a series of experiments on coaxial cable, and they found some interesting things. Uh, first, the best coaxial cable impedances, they, they came up with a list of three there. For high power, 30 ohms works best. For high voltage, 60 ohm cable works best. And for the lowest attenuation, 77 ohms. So that's uh, a little variance there. Generally, they decided that uh, for minimum attenuation, that um, the, the cable should be 76.7 ohms. However, you know, we don't really see that. Um, what we're likely to see is a compromise. The difference between, say, 30 ohms and 77 ohms, right there in the middle, falls around 50 ohms. And that's why we use 50 ohm cables. It's a compromise for power handling versus uh, losses in the cable. Now, we want to transfer the maximum amount of power from our transmitter into the antenna, uh, yet we also want to be able to receive off that same cable in two-way radio. So we're concerned about the loss that's in it for a receive signal as well because that's, that's a tiny signal. So for receive and low-level signal cables, most of the time you're going to find those are 75 ohms. That's what um, television antenna cable is of the coaxial variety. Uh, that's what most cable... TV systems use is 75 ohms. Uh, so 50 ohms was a compromise between power handling and attenuation. Uh, 
to work optimally, all the components in a coaxial system need to be the same impedance. They they need to be matched. So if you've got a transmitter that's got a 50 ohm output, you're going to run it into a 50 ohm cable, and your antenna out on the end ought to be 50 ohms as well. If it's not, then you're going to have some reflections on your transmission line there, and you're going to have some losses. If the end of a coaxial cable is open, then it is going to um, act like there's infinite resistance at the end of it. If it's shorted, it's going to act like, uh, you know, basically it's near zero ohms on it. And there are, you'll get reflections in either case. However, in the case of a shorted cable, uh, those reflections are going to be uh, exactly the opposite polarity as uh, those of a open cable. Now, there are some cables out there. You know, we we are uh, generally always going to see either 50 ohms for our transmitting gear, our ham gear, or 75 ohms for uh, television coax or satellite TV and such. You can use that 75 ohm cable with your ham gear if you make matching transformers and of uh, various types, put them on the ends there to match your gear to operate on 75 ohms. But as we learned right there, you know, that's not the best for power handling. However, there, there are people doing it and doing it successfully. So 50 ohms and 75 ohms are, are what we're used to running across. But would you believe there's a couple other impedances that are somewhat common out there? Uh, we don't see them that much, but they've been used in the past. RG62, that's a 93-ohm coaxial cable, which I actually found some in my radio studios here recently. Uh, it wasn't used anymore. It was just run through the ceilings and couldn't really figure out what it was for. Well, turns out that um, RG62 cable was pretty common with mainframe computer systems back in the uh, 70s and the early 80s. And that's uh, actually what it was there for. It made sense after, um, you know, determine that. But that's 93-ohm coax. So I couldn't do anything with it. So it's still just uh, running through the attic and unterminated on either ends. There's another impedance of cable that I was totally unaware of. Uh, that's RG63. And that's 125-ohm coax. Why would they need 125 ohms of impedance on that? I don't know. It's uh, used in aerospace, so maybe some rocket scientist has, has a good reason for 125 ohms. I just don't happen to know what it is, though. So that's just um, some interesting facts about coaxial cable there. You know, there's some hams that really won't touch it. They only go with ladder line. Uh, for their antenna connections, and there's good reasons for that as well because the ladder line is, is basically, you know, two parallel conductors. Uh, that's a higher impedance, typically uh, 300 ohms or, or 4, 450 on up. That kind of cable is not going to suffer as much loss um, with impedance mismatches at the ends of it as we will have with coax. So that's one good reason to use ladder line. It gives us a little more flexibility there without having as much loss in it. Uh, coax, it's got its uh, pluses too, though, uh, because you can run it you know, virtually everywhere. You don't have to worry about standing it off from metal or anything like that. Also, the shielding kind of helps keep out interfering signals. So, you know, coax is considered... Um, an unbalanced cable, a ladder line would be considered a balanced cable. So they both, uh, you, you can't interchange one with the other without doing some um, special matching there, but it is possible. And we're going to always see coax on a VHF or UHF radios. Um, probably the ver uh, majority of six-meter installations, I would think, use coaxial cable, but you get down to the HF frequencies, it could be either one. You could be using coax or you could be using ladder line. 
just as long as you got proper matching on both ends of it there. So a little fun facts on coaxial cable there. We've covered this before, and perhaps we'll bring it up again in a little more detail, but uh, just some interesting facts that I ran across um, the last couple of weeks and just thought I would share them there. <laughs> 